Hello and welcome to another live stream from the Faculty of Computing, Engineering and Media here at DMU. Um, my name is Lenny and I am a third year media production student, but don't worry, the live stream isn't on media production today. Today's is going to be a little more focused around studying engineering at DMU. So we've got um, a couple of our academics that are going to be joining us as well as a student so you can get all of the perspectives about the course and get all the information that you'll be needing ahead of September. Um, so we've got um, the faculty members are specialising in engineering areas um, and we're also going to be getting some live demonstrations which you might be able to try out at home afterwards. I don't quite know how difficult they are but maybe you're up to the challenge um, so make sure you don't miss that out and I think we're also going to be getting a little bit of a live demonstration of some of the CAD software that will be available for students um, when you start studying the course so that's quite exciting as well. Um, so yeah you'll be getting a little bit of a an experience of what it's like to be a first year student um, because we have got a student who's just finishing his first year um, and also a bit of an expert view um, from our lecturers which is great so um, I think just before I welcome the guests onto the stream um, if you're in the comments make sure to let us know say hi let us know that you're there um, and if you've got any questions throughout the stream at all feel free to leave them in the comments section and we will answer them. As I said, we've got the expert lecturers as well as a student who's been here for a whole year. So they know everything that they'll need to know about engineering and hopefully it's everything that you need to know. Um, if not, we will be able to push you in the right direction of where you can get those questions answered. So as a few more people are um, joining the live stream, I think we'll welcome our first guest, which is Dr. Richard Bailey, who is going to be leading today's live stream. Um, and he is a lecturer from engineering. Hi, Richard, how are you? Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm doing, doing really well. Thank you. Good. So is it, um, what exactly is it you're going to be doing today then for us? So I'm going to go through some of the engineering software that we, we, we introduced to our first year students. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe have a look at some of the virtual learning environment as well. So see some of the resources that we have available. Sounds good. And we're also joined by Dr. Ian, um, who is also an engineering lecturer. So Hello. Here's Ian. How are you today? I'm very well. How are you, Leone? Good. I'm good, thank you. It's a little bit grey outside, but not too bad. I'm nice and warm inside, so it's all good. <laughs> cool. Um, and as I said, we have also got a student. So Connor is also here with us today, and he's a first year engineering student, so knows everything to do about the course and exactly what first year is like here. Hello. How are you? Brilliant, yeah. Can't wait to answer some good questions and hopefully give people <laughs> some insight. So that's good. So as we said, if you have any questions for any of our lecturers or for Connor, just leave them in the comments um, and we'll be able to try and help answer those. Um, but I think are we starting with the CAD demonstration today? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to go ahead with that. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to switch my screen over so that you guys can see my desktop and we'll go over some of the software in which mm -hmm. um, you should, if you decide to come and join us, you should be able to uh, get used to using. So I'm just going to switch my screen now. Uh, okay, so everyone should be able to see my screen at the moment. So I'm going to kick off with showing you Creo Parametric. So we basically use two different design and analysis softwares uh, within the mechanical engineering program at Um uh, The first one is Creo Parametric, and that is a fully featured solid modeling software. It's parametric, so all of your designs are based upon actual values and dimensions and then we put in to the software. Now. There are various different softwares available. Uh, we chose Creo because it gives you um, a really good experience as a student, as you're allowed to download your own version of the software onto your, onto your own machine. And it's fully compatible with the version that we have at the university as well. So transferring files is really easy and it's really great. Um, fully functional CAD software. Um, some people often ask us the question, why do we use Creo? And that, that is the reason, the primary reason that we use Creo is that it, it gives you the opportunity of getting the software yourself on your laptop. Now, what we teach you is basically the principles of CAD, not actually the software in itself. So whatever you learn with us 
will be translatable to various different CAD software packages. And so what we have on screen at the moment is actually what our first years will be assembling in from October. So mm -hmm. this is actually a component from our Formula student car. So this is the front upright assembly for the front wheel, front left wheel. And what our students will do next year is actually constructing this assembly. So mm -hmm. we get various different ability levels starting. So some students might never have touched CAD before. Some might have got quite a lot of experience, but we design the module so that it works from the ground up. So whatever level of experience you've got, you will eventually get to the point where you can generate this assembly. Okay, so you, if we explode this out, you can see there are various different components. And the idea is, is that we build you up with some examples, so some simpler components. We've got some simple, simple geometry just here. And eventually you'll get to the point where you will be able to construct this. And it might look overwhelming at first, but you know we break it down and we help you every step of the way. So this is just Creo and the primary primary software that we use to actually design components. Now, as part of being an engineer, we don't just design components, we actually want to make sure that they function correctly. Okay, so in order to do that, we have we also analyze our components. And so creating CAD models is the first part of that. So we create our components, and then what we want to do is say, okay, I've designed this part, how will it perform? And so we have another piece of software that we use for that. And so we use ANSYS for this. And so ANSYS is a multi-simulation software which can do various different types of so um, analysis, whether it be static structural or thermal analysis, or even computerized fluid dynamics, okay? And so what our first years will also do is take one of these components. So I've took out one of the parts from our full assembly. So I've taken this upright component here and I've transferred it into ANSYS. And if I actually wanted to try and work out you know, how this will respond to different loads, different forces that are being applied to it, it could mm -hmm. be very difficult to do that using traditional hand calculations. Okay. So what we actually have is a numerical way of doing it. And it's primarily, it's quite straightforward and the software is, is quite easy to use. But what we do is we take our model and we break it down into small chunks. Okay, so you can see here, we've got our, our original model. And we've now made it small parts. Okay, so we've made it into finite chunks. And what we then do is use something called finite element method. Okay, so we've got these chunks and what the computer can do is work out how each one of these chunks respond to different loads. And if you try to do this by hand, it would take forever. You know, the calculations, the matrix that you, you generate is huge. Mm. But computers are very good at solving these um, equations and do it very quickly. So it saves us a lot of time. So we break our model down into these small chunks. And then we can apply some loads to it, some boundary conditions. So if we have a look here, we've got various different forces that have been applied. So on here, we would have a brake caliper. And so there'd be a braking force. So we can apply the braking force. Steering rod attaches here. So we can put, apply a steering force. And various different forces depending on the situation. And so once we've done this, the software will then tell us how this component will respond to those loads. So if we have a look at the deformation, we can see how this part will bend. Obviously, this is exaggerated. If we have a look at the values mm -hmm. that are on the screen, we're talking 0.2 millimeters. So we're not talking a massive amount of deflection, but we can see how this part will react to different loads. So this is the deflection, and we can also look at the stress. Okay, so we've got the stress there. So this mm -hmm. is really important for us as engineers because it means that if we can actually model and simulate our designs, we don't have to build as many prototypes or tests. Okay, so when we try to look at sustainability, uh, making sure that our impact on the on the on the planet is minimised, 
using this kind of software really does help us. Okay. So this is a glimpse of what, what we get our students to do in the first year. Okay, So they will design some components, they will then analyze them, and then the final part would be actually using this analysis to update mm -hmm. our design. So if we have a look at this component here, okay, we've got this red region down at the bottom that has yeah. high stress. Now, okay, that, there's high stress there, but then the rest of it's blue, which means that the stress is really, really low, okay? And so we can update our design and remove some of this material. So we can make it more lightweight. And if the component mm -hmm. is more lightweight, then if it's on the car, it's gonna help improve performance, okay? Mm, so this cool. is a, yeah, it's a fundamental part of engineering. Yeah. So that's just a quick idea of what would be happening in the first year with regards to the software. Mm -hmm. Now, if I move over to Blackboard a second. So the way in which we help build up our students so that they get to the point that they can actually develop these models is through a series of different tutorials. We're not going to make you jump straight in and go to these complicated parts. So yeah. if you go to learning materials, we have various different demonstrations. Okay. So we can go through here. We've got all these like small videos. They're probably like three to four minutes long. Mm -hmm. And they can show you the basic principles of using the software. So sometimes you might know how to do something, then you think, oh, I just need to use this tool. Oh, how, how do I remember that? You know, and this resource is there, like showing you how you can actually do all of these different things within the software yeah. for advanced features here okay so that's all i was going to show today but if you do if anyone does have any questions about this please get in touch with us in the chat mm -hmm. yeah, just go through anything so connor i believe you've been using this software um over your first year how did you find it when you were using it i have I thought Creo was such a brilliant software, especially to start on, because um, mm. a lot of the basic functions which you start to learn at the beginning really help you as you make your way through your coursework. And especially like towards the end of it where you're doing more complex procedures, um, yeah. it, it really helps having the support from Richard and your classmates. And mm -hmm. especially with Creo being so easy to use, it's quite nice to pick up and you really do feel like you're getting quite a good engineering designing experience while you're using the software. That's great. And you were saying before, Richard, that students will get access to this from first year all the way through the course. Yeah, then? it's vital that students have access to this on their personal machine. Mm -hmm. okay, so obviously we have fully fitted out labs, uh, which all have these, all have the software on them, but having your own personal copy means that you can be doing work when you're at home, you know, Maybe you're not on campus. You can still mm -hmm. go about doing your designs. You know, helping you, helping, yeah. you, helping you learn basically. Yeah, that's great. And um, and I think we had a question that was about asking about how easy it was to get the hang of the software if you'd never used it before. I guess those tutorials that we sh you were showing us and um, that you've got on Blackboard are quite helpful. Um, but did you find it was difficult to get the hang of then, Connor? Um, I thought the tutorials were really loud and clear when it came to using certain tools. So mm. I know while I was doing mine, uh, I had a lot of trouble doing a helical sweep, which was to get the filament of a screw. Uh, I didn't build the wheel, but I bought an, I built an oil pump instead. Um, I had to watch the tutorial a few times, but uh, obviously watching it again and again made it more clear and eventually it did just become easy to do. So yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's quite nice to pick up, it really is. I'll just say that the idea behind the videos that we provide is not that we show you how to design the components. So obviously Connor had a, they had an oil uh, mm. they had to design. Uh, so the, the videos that we provide don't show you how to make the parts. They show you how to use the tools. Okay, so mm -hmm. the idea is that we show you the basic principles and then you have to practice and like allude, and use your own basic spatial re uh, reasoning skills to be able to yeah. generate those shapes. Mm -hmm. And That's another great. thing that definitely helped with the um, early stages, at least, was we had a couple demo parts, which we made before we started our coursework. Um, mm -hmm. So what we had was like cubes that we had holes in, and then yeah. we made some shafts to then put through those cubes. 
and you you get a good little gist of how the whole thing works before you then have to jump into your coursework. So yeah. yeah, it was it was really nice having those sort of tools provided. Yeah, that's really good then. Um, so Richard, is this like software, the CAD software, is that one that's used heavily across the different industries for engineering? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, some big companies that we know are using Creo at the moment. So yeah. Caterpillar to name one of them. But the, the, I wouldn't get so fixated on the fact of the software that we use because mm -hmm. if you use this software, you can quite easily translate to SolidWorks or Siemens NX, you know, as long as you understand the basic principle of, of how they how they work. Yeah. Okay, the, the icon might change slightly, but the basic functionality is the same. So yeah. you know, don't get too hung up on, you know, actually the software. It's more mm -hmm. how to use it that's that's important. Yeah. Um, and then we had one more question, which was about the CAD software. Um, do you recommend that students try and get some practice on some kind of software before, whether that's this one or other ones before you come to university? I can see Connor shaking his head. There. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Pick up as much as you can. Sorry, go on, Richard. So what I would say is that if you, if you are planning on, if you've got a education email address, so if you've got a college or, or a school email address, then you can download the student version of Creo, mm -hmm. you know, before you come. Any any kind of head start that you get means that you can just jump in at a slightly higher level than someone who's never used it before. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I haven't used CAD software before, but I know on my course with some of the softwares that we were using for like editing and things, people that had slight experience in it were slightly more comfortable with getting a bit more experimental with coursework, which is always good. And it's always easier to be more when you're more comfortable in one aspect because going to uni and in general can be quite a big transition. So, absolutely. Cool. Um, so that was all the questions that we had about the CAD software at the moment. If anyone has any more, um, feel free to leave them in the comments, um, and we'll try and answer those best we can for you. But I think we um, have got a live demo that's coming from Ian now. Hello. Hello. So I believe you've got a live demo that you're going to show us. So I'm, I thought I'd show you two. Mm -hmm. um, one slightly riskier than the other, as you know, from Monday. <laughs> um, yes. But part of the, we're in unusual times at the moment. So we are looking at ways that we can use this to enhance our course in the general sense. So one of the things we, we are aiming to do is to send out some kits so that if there's limited availability of the labs because of social distancing students will still be able to do some experiments that we will um, direct them but with kits that we've sent out to them uh, we haven't we are working on this so um what i've got is a sort of example that i've knocked up um as a sort of thing that we might do so this is just a standard fidget spinner um which were in vogue what two years ago um but I've adapted it slightly by putting a, a hook on it. And then I've just got a wire that I can attach to it. And that's, that's why I put the hook on it. And my wife is very kindly providing a finger. <laughs> so um, so um, and what you, the thing about fidget spinners is they are designed to spin. And spinning things is a really, really important part of engineering. You get all sorts of really interesting effects. Um, in particular, you get a thing called, um, you get some gyroscopic effects. So if I give this a spin, first thing you notice is it doesn't topple over, but you may also notice that it's rotating around its axis. Um, the first thing is called gyroscopic stability, and we'll tell you all about that. The second thing is called gyroscopic precession, and we'll tell you all about that. There is so many things that have rotating machinery and whether that's a an aircraft engine or a washing machine um, these effects are absolutely critical to that so that's my first demonstration now my wife is looking very nervous about the second one because i uh, i did this on monday and I, I tripped over my daughter who i was intending to do it over her head but this is the yeah, so what i've got is a jam jar and a bottle of water and what i'm going to do is i'm going to pour water into the top of the jam jar and uh, for some reason they weren't 
they haven't volunteered this time to stand underneath it after what happened on Monday. But there is a, quite a well-known thing you can do, which is you can turn upside down and take the hand away. That's fine, except that that's a little bit boring. So I thought what I would do would be to take the card away. And as you see, it's um, it stays in the jam jar. And I say normally hold this over a student, but what you can see is it's actually quite unstable and it runs out. Um, I have to say, I do something like that in every one of my lectures. I've just arrived at DMU, um, but I will be teaching this subject. So um, be warned, there will be something like that in every lecture. OK, so that's my two demonstrations. Um, and we thought we'd now talk about your your course. Mm -hmm. Sounds like mind. if you go into one of your lectures, it might be a good idea to bring a raincoat then. <laughs> 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 just to be on the safe side. Connor may have to volunteer for that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have had a few questions um, about the course and everything like that. Um, the first one is relating to um, coronavirus and things like that. If anyone has got specific questions about how the course will be affected, we've got um, the coronavirus section of the DMU website, um, which is on, the link is on the screen now. So you can go and visit that and it's got all of the updates as they come along um, just to let you guys know exactly what's happening and what will be happening in September. Um, but this question wasn't related to the course specifically. This one was um, about the areas of engineering that will be in demand after COVID-19. Um, are there any specific areas that you guys know of? I think one thing that's worth bearing in mind about engineers generally is engineers are problem solvers. So engineers have always been in demand across the boundaries, uh, hmm. which is why so many engineers um, try to be recruited by or um, banks and the like try to recruit them uh, because banks have problems just as um, engineering companies do. So, and what you'll see after COVID is a whole range of problems that need to be solved and engineers are excellent at doing that. And you can see that through the crisis that um, no sooner have we had gone into lockdown and we had engineering companies who make aircraft suddenly making things like ventilators and PPE equipment. Um, so, and of course, if we get a vaccine, that'll be engineers again who who um, produce the the process that enables us to, to make that in large scale. Mm -hmm. The fact that we can do, we've responded so quickly is all down to engineers. And in fact, if you think about the number of things like this where people have done things online, again, that wasn't possible without engineers. So I think engineers will be highly in demand simply because they're problem solvers. Uh, but you will, I would expect that traditional engineering will also bounce back afterwards because there will always be a need for it. Yeah. Richard and Connor, have you got any specific areas that you think would be in demand after COVID-19? Go on, Richard. You, you, you <laughs> I, I, just, I just think it's that it's... Um, you know, if we if we have a look at the effects of what's happened during COVID, you know, the lack of the traffic, you know, the way that the pollution levels have, have dropped, mm -hmm. and you know, the benefits to health. So I really think like electrification of our of our automotive industry, you know, these kind of things, like looking for renewable energy sources, you know, those kind of areas that that were big yeah. and that were growth anyway are just going to carry on and maybe get pushed higher up the agenda because I, I know that I like to have clean air to breathe and I've, I've really. Yeah. I've really noticed it, you know, as I've been going around, how, how much nicer you know, the air quality has been. So, mm. yeah. Definitely. Um, so we've had another question kind of related to this. Um, the student is asking, how is the engineering department preparing for the start of the course um, in September again? Or October even, so. Do you want to go first, Richard, then I'll follow up? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously we're spending a lot of time at the moment discussing, you know, various different... Like mm. possibilities what could be happening but you know fundamentally our, our primary concern is making sure that we deliver a really good experience to our students you know making yeah. sure you, you know engineering traditionally like the way our approach is that we like to be quite hands-on you know our course its unique selling point is the fact that like we like to get you in the labs we like to, to have you hands-on with things and so the planning that we're doing at the moment so Ian's already giving us some examples of, of some demonstrations you know trying to get mm -hmm. 
get anything that we can, like trying to come up with maybe lab in a box, something like that, anything that we can get out to our students, uh, where we yeah. can actually get them to feel engineering. You, you, like, mm -hmm. I'm a very firm believer that you feel engineering, it's not just about reading it from a book. So we need to yeah. find it. So we, we're working through trying to make things as interactive as possible. Mm -hmm. And you know, some in some cases we might have to replace live labs with simulations or things like that. Mm -hmm. We are working on it behind the scenes. I'm sure Ian's got some more that he would like maybe like to add to what I've said. I, I agree with everything that Rich has just said, and I, I think it's what I said about being problem solvers. We we're not looking at this in a negative way. We're looking at this. Well, actually, what can we do to enhance what we already do? Now we nobody really knows what the situation is going to be like in october whether or not we're going to have large access to the lab or very limited access to labs whatever we do what we are we are planning very uh, carefully i spend quite a lot of my time doing um is and other colleagues as well is actually planning for how we're going to deliver things if we can't get that access to labs and i don't think you know, even this need to think of simulation as being a step backwards simulation is an incredibly important part of uh, engineering yeah and day to day that's what a lot of engineers do and i also say that in a lot of engineering companies they are global companies and so what they don't do is fly around the world all the time quite a lot of the time they're doing this sort of interaction anyway and so um, we want to make that as smooth as possible where we have to do mm -hmm. it. But what we as a school want to do is not have lots of pre-recorded things for people to watch. We want to we want to do things live. So we're <laughs> in terms of labs, um, if we have to, uh, ha well, we'll, ha we'll certainly have some, some kit bot. I can't absolutely tell you precisely what will be in them at this point because we've got to source things. But... There will be some kit boxes that will go out to do a lab in a box, as Richard described it. Uh, but um, we're also the the lectures. We were going to we we do more seminars anyway. They're interactive with the students, and we if, if we can't be in the lecture theatre, we still want to have that interaction. So there's still going to be um, live sessions with interaction from from the audience from the from the students. Yeah. That sounds great. It sounds really promising. Um, there's someone that's got a bit of a concern um, about the course. They said that they've received a lower grade on mathematics than I would have liked. Would I benefit from engineering year zero? Do you mind if I answer this one? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So that sweet. Um, I uh, started the course in year one. I didn't do year zero, but I had a lot of friends who did do year zero. And one thing that I noticed that they definitely were stronger at was the familiarization with the basic principles of each module. So with mathematics, for instance, they were already kind of familiar with the uh, calculus side of things, as well as the mechanical side of mathematics. Uh, also, especially in Richard's module with CAD, uh, they had already had some experience on Creo, um, which meant that they were able to pick up and start their coursework a lot quicker than other people. And it's those sort of benefits that you get from year zero, which really do have a knock on effect, especially mm -hmm. in your first year. So if you do feel unconfident with your maths or any other area, uh, I would seriously recommend year zero. Yeah. Cool. Did you guys have anything else to add for that? Or I mean, we do offer fantastic support to for like maths help. Um, I don't know if Connor, you've used any of it, but the, we have a maths learning center within the library and they're fantastic you know they offer e extra sessions you know if you feel like you're not quite oh i don't quite get this area or, or whatever you know you can go and you can go to them and they're actually embedded within our program as well so it's not just you know i oh, will go with it with any problem you know that they're, they're yeah. there and they know about the engineering problems as well so they, mm -hmm. they know our curriculum and they're able to assist you in, in any way that they can yeah that's great um, so I think so Richard's point is yeah. there is a lot of support. Sorry, I no, guess there's fine. a lot Carry of support on. available to students throughout the course. But also, I would just sort of echo what Connor said about Year Zero. These are actually incredibly good parts of courses. And I, I know lots of lecturers, for example, um, at other universities who have gone through the equivalent of a Year Zero, 
and and now they are lecturing um and uh, teaching people for phds and uh, and the like mm -hmm. so you know it is incredibly good resource so if, you know if if that's something you would benefit from i would i would encourage you to do it because it, they are they are fantastic definitely um so we had another student who's asking about the engineering courses are they accredited courses i know that um Aaron Stop, engineering okay uh, so the, um mechanical engineering at the moment has accreditation from iet uh we're actually under we're going through the uh accreditation process with the imec at the moment so we're just waiting for the outcome of that we're very hopeful that we were accredited before and we're hoping that it, it will carry on um obviously it's just we're just waiting to hear back from you. Yeah. Um, I should say we're quite a way down that path. Yeah. We're quite a way down that path in that you know they've, in principle, agreed. They've they've just got to sign on the dotted line with the various things that they they um, that they've asked us, uh, which we've responded to, and we're waiting for a response to that. But it's not like we're waiting for a visit. But they've had the visit, <laughs> and you know we're quite a long way down. So we would hope to have that fairly. Soon. Well, were you saying something about um, aeronautical, Connor? Yeah, um, so aeronautical engineering has just started with DMU. Um, I was the first year to have it, so it hasn't received accreditation yet, but they are looking to have it in the next few years from Royal Aeronautical Engineering Society and IMECI as well. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so someone else has been asking about things a little bit different to do with the course. Um, they wondered if there are any study abroad schemes or any travel opportunities um, within the engineering courses. So I, I'll just say um, DMU has its flagship uh, programme, which is DMU Global. So we are mm -hmm. always trying to get um, events where we can take our students abroad so they can experience a different culture and uh, really, really just be part of like, a, global, a global community of engineers. Um, so DME Global was the flagship program. Um, so a couple of years ago, we actually took a, I was a lead for one of those trips and we went to New York. So we mm -hmm. managed to go to the United Nations as part of like a mass trip with DMU. And then we went to go and see like um, the Intrepid experience there. So they've got basically a docked or aircraft carrier with, with like obviously They've got one of the uh, space shuttles in there, so we've got to see like some examples of like you know real <laughs> engineering, you know some, yeah. some of those bits. Uh, yeah, it's it's a great, year. and I know every year we at least try to get one um, mm -hmm. trip done through DMU Global. Um, yeah, it's quite, quite a regular one that goes to Poland as well, visits one of the uh, uh, academic institutions over in Poland. Um, mm -hmm. Last year we had one that went to Prague. So they went to see uh, the Skoda factory to see how things happen there. So it really is something that we take seriously and, and try to, to give as many opportunities as we can. Not just that's just like internationally, but also yeah. locally, trying to arrange trips to, to different companies, uh, to our industrial partners. You know, these are all things that we try to do for all of our uh, or, or to to expose our students to to the industry. You know, we we'll, we'll arrive. Industry. Yeah. Have you been able to go on any of those trips at all, Connor? Um, I haven't had a trip anywhere abroad yet, and we mm -hmm. did have one organised to go to the Airbus factory just outside of Leicester, um, but that was cut off because of coronavirus. We were all quite gutted, <laughs> but yeah. Um, obviously, because aeronautical engineering is quite a new course, there isn't too much on our plate yet in terms of going abroad. Um, but aviation in the UK is still quite a massive. Uh, industry, so there is still plenty yeah. of opportunity to travel the UK. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I've personally I've been on a DME Global trip as well, so I'd highly recommend it. I went to Tokyo, which wow. is kind of wow. crazy, um, but I got to see the media industry out there, and I know I think that all of the courses try to go to as many different places as possible. So DME Global is definitely something that's worth um, looking at when you're coming here. Um, so we've had another question um, from a student. They're asking, is it easy to transfer from course to course after the first year, say from mechatronics to mechanical engineering? Transferring is something that we don't actually offer at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. The way that our 
syllabus has been designed, it means that uh, you don't really cover the correct sort of areas. So it makes it very difficult for us to do that. Okay. Yeah. That's good. So make sure you've, you it's choose the, the right course for you at the beginning. The, the, the first years have been tailored to each each program. So it makes it quite difficult. In, in yeah. If a student was to get to the end of their first year and didn't like the course anymore, though, would they be able to um, apply to do a different course and then say do that course from first year again? They could do it from first year again. They could. Okay, cool. Um, then there's another one that's asked, how actively engaged are the staff with research? So, I mean, I could talk on this. Or, Do you want yeah, me to that? Could, yeah, you, you go ahead. Okay, would you go first and then I'll talk about it. It's just, I'll I just uh, go from experience. So as, it, as it happens, mm -hmm. the School of Engineering. Ian, do you want to? Oh, I can't hear you. Um, sorry, I've got a bit of a funny connection today. Um, so the School of Engineering is actually the most actively involved in research the whole universe. Are well, you having some technical? <laughs> this, is, this is where that screen comes I don't know if you're, if you're back. You start, I, I went off there for a second. Sorry about that. Yeah. It's okay. So the schools in the university the the engineering school is actually the most actively involved in research um, mm -hmm. that was the main point I would, I would want to make but um, there are a lot of staff involved in lots of research and and actually that research informs our teaching as well uh, you know, it's one of our selling points is that what we teach is bang up to date because it's based on the research that we're doing which is you know the nature of research is that it's up to date and new and if Richard wants to add to that um, yeah. <laughs> at last count, ninety percent of our staff are actually research active. So that means that they are actively doing some kind of research. And I just reiterate what Ian said in the fact that you know doing research means that we're current and we're relevant. Yeah. So we're teaching you guys what's current and what's relevant. So that's why it's really important that we do that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so we've had a few questions now about more of the student side of things. And um, so, Connor, what societies is it that you're involved in um, at DMU? So I'm not actually in any societies, but we've um, instead decided to create our own sort of society. Um, mm -hmm. Most people will probably know about DMU Racing, uh, the aeronautical engineering. Students have decided to band together and form a club called the DMU Flight Club. Mm -hmm. uh, it acts as a society and it will act as a society next year in that we'll meet up on a weekly basis. Uh, yeah. We'll also be looking to enter some iMechi competitions. Uh, so the main one we had our eyes on at the minute was the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Challenge. But um, society-wise, I haven't got myself involved in many, which I would say is something that I'd regret. Uh, so make sure in first year that you do put yourself out there and yeah. um, try, and, try and attend as many or try out as many societies as possible because you might find something very new, which you didn't expect to love. but Mm -hmm. yeah there's there's yeah. a great opportunity to get involved in societies so yeah definitely if i could add to that um because mm -hmm. connor summed it up very well notice his answer was that actually he effectively formed his own society and yeah. i think that's something i would like to encourage i think societies work best if they're driven by the students and, and connor will probably confirm that after i met him for the first time on uh, was it yesterday day before yesterday yeah um I followed up with another meeting with Connor to discuss that precise subject and, and how society student societies might enhance both their your learning experience but also your student experience of mm. uh, whilst you're studying. Yeah. Cool. Um so then something a little bit more towards the core space. Um someone's asked how supportive were staff outside of lesson times? Um, so outside of lesson times, you could always email them, email your teachers, email your lecturers, uh, mm -hmm. and you'd, you'd probably have a response within the day, uh, if yeah. not sooner, which was always great. Um, you could also have one-to-one -one sessions with your personal tutor, and mm -hmm. you can often get one-to-one -one sessions with your module tutors as well. So there's plenty of support outside of the less, lesson yeah. time. Uh, if you have any questions straight away, you can obviously go up to people at the end of the lectures. It's, it's quite a relaxed form of help but it's always there to help you so yeah there's plenty of that's support. great to hear yeah. yeah 
Um, then there's been another question, which is again slightly less to do with the course specifically, but someone's asked, um, what is it like living in Leicester? Uh, I, I like it. I, I really like it because yeah. I've come from Norfolk, which is quite a like out in the sticks, middle of nowhere sort of um, mm -hmm. city. There's not too much around, especially when you live outside of the city. So to move to Leicester and be right in the thick of it, uh, having everything five minutes from your doorstep has been brilliant for me. Um, so, yeah, there, there's sort of a, a lot of opportunity, even outside of DMU, you've got plenty of opportunity. Yeah, that's great to hear. And then there's one other question that we've had, um, which is about the opportunities of getting a part-time job alongside studying. Are there a lot of chances to be able to earn money on the side of things? Um, yeah, so the uni offers a job role within a company called Uni Temps. Mm -hmm. uh, and they work alongside the uni to host events like Taster Days and University Tours. Uh, you can get involved with those uh, and collect quite a, it's, it's quite a nice little paycheck every month if you do get involved. Um, and it really yeah. does help you if you are in need of some money. So uh, not, not to mention just outside of uni, um, there's McDonald's is nearby, which will always hire and other, other fast food restaurants, stuff like that um supermarkets and stuff there's plenty there's plenty of jobs around yeah yeah that's always always a good um thing to hear so you know you won't be too difficult while you're at uni um yeah. but yeah so that is all the questions that we've had today if any of you haven't been able to ask your questions or you're a bit nervous to ask them during the live stream then you can um head onto our website and hopefully get some information on there contact our inquiries team which you can see the email address and phone number on the screen now um Head on to our website, we've got a UniBuddy system, which you means you can talk to current students and also some lecturers and things that are on there. So if you have any questions, um, they're the ideal people to ask and they respond pretty quickly. So that's always good. Um, but we'd like to thank you all for joining and for the questions you've had today. We have got many other live streams coming up, especially on our Digital Open Day, which is the 4th of July. If you haven't signed up already, make sure you do using the link here, www.dmu.ac.uk forward slash open days. We've got a lot of opportunities there with live campus tours, um, different things about courses and the extra student opportunities, things like societies like um, Connor and Ian have been talking about today. And if you have any other questions for lecturers, that'll be a great time to be able to ask them there. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of different things booked, so make sure you do book onto that. Um, and we hope to see you soon. Have a great day, everyone. See you later. Bye. <clears throat> Bye.